Hey there, Dr. Bird here, ready to do a little story time. And today I am going to do a little bit of responding to some very appropriate pushback that happened after I tried to do some sort of informative engagement with what's going on in Israel and Gaza. And again, not my wheelhouse. I'm not going to stay there today. <laughs> Just going to touch on something very, very quickly. And again, come at this as a biblical scholar. And then we're going to talk about some, we're going to keep moving. We're going to do some passages in First Samuel, talk about a couple of those that apply to the lens that we're looking at in this, um, this ongoing live stream uh, story time, looking at passages that talk about sex, marriage, and uh, engagements between people that involve violence and intimate body parts. So hang on and we will get right to it. So I want to do a couple shameless plugs here. Thank you so much for being here. If you're here live, if you're able to want to be here live, um, listening with it in the background, whatever the case, thank you for being here. Thanks for watching later. I appreciate that there are people who want to hear what I have to say, and I do hope that I offer something helpful for you. So I appreciate when you subscribe to my channel or when you like videos or pass along a video to someone who you think might also enjoy it and in that way help me spread the word. So thank you for all the different ways that people support the work I do. I do have a little thing scrolling across the bottom here about my book that's coming out soon. It will be in print by the end of this month and, they, and it should be in people's hands a couple weeks after that. So if you're interested, the book I have coming out is called Marriage in the Bible, What Do the Texts Say? So it is um, geared towards a general audience. It's not just towards people of faith. This is, um, this is a global issue, and it is framed that way. This is an issue that people have um, around the world, and it comes up in political spaces, public spaces. This isn't just a conversation in, like, people of faith kind of huddles. This, is, this happens in public. This happens in political spaces. And we have a global issue around understanding how to handle and talk well about this issue of marriage, who is allowed, I use that with air quotes, to be married, all of those things. So the book, um, I think, is probably the most important thing, contribution I will make in this world. So I'm quite proud of it. And I encourage you to take a look at the website even, just to go take a look to see what the, the chapters are. You can see some blurbs. There is a discount, but you have to, it only works on the publisher website. So the discount doesn't work at Amazon, but you can get it through Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, wherever you get books. And the e-version e through the website, through the publisher, I think also gets the discount if you're interested. So it's RL Family and Friends, F A N D F three zero. So that's the book that's coming out very soon. Very excited about that. And I'm interested in that book in doing the same thing that I do here in live stream and in any anything that I do, actually, that I'm putting into a public space. I'm trying to invite people to take biblical texts very seriously first and to the best of our ability on their own terms and then figure out what you might want to do with it or not from there. So that's what that book is all about, looking at what... Um, you know, what people think biblical marriage actually is, and then looking at what those passages are that people use to define biblical marriage. I look at those, and then I actually look at what marriage looks like in the Bible. And that is what has led to this particular twice a week live stream of looking at biblical texts that apply to sex, marriage, and intimate engagements that involve violence. So, because that's what marriage looks like in the Bible. Okay, so there we are. 
Um, I'm going to, we can stop this now. Oops. I got to go back over here. Nope. It's right there. Oh, okay. Let's stop that now. Okay. So we can get back to what we're doing today. Okay. So I wanted to start off by looking at, um, a passage in first Samuel, and I am going to tie this in to what, to s some comments that came up last week. And I wanted to tie it all back into the work that I'm trying to do as a biblical scholar. Okay. So as I look through looking for the three, the two, the three primary themes, right? You know, sex, marriage, and events that involve intimate body parts and violence, right? I was looking through and last week on Thursday, when I tried to do more of just a conversation about what's going on, um, presently in Israel and Gaza. Um, I referred to the next chapter we were looking at, which was 1 Samuel 4. Um, and what struck me then and strikes me now will always, I think, be the case, um, is that these scriptures are full of fighting. <laughs> That's kind of one of the most obvious things I think I've ever said. But it's important for me to note that the sacred writings of this group of people, right, that were that were pulled together 2,500 years ago, the stories themselves go back farther, but these scriptures, book after book after book, talk about violence and war and God sometimes siding with God's people and sometimes choosing to let God's people be, be, get their asses kicked. Um, I mean, you look at chapter four of first Samuel, right? And I read the first couple of verses last week. In those days, the Philistines mustered for war against Israel and Israel went out to battle against them. They encamped at Ebenezer and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel. And when the battle was joined, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. When the troops came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord put us to rout today before the Philistines? So absolutely constantly thinking about God being intimately involved in every single thing and actually directing it. Like, why would God put us to rout? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh so that he may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. And so you have this thing going back and forth and the presence of the Lord must be what it's going to take for us to win or not. And they steal the presence of the, the Ark of the Covenant and they get it back. And, the, the, and then you, you look at the next chapter and there's talks of battle and fighting and war and slaughter and how many people die, how many thousands of people die, chapter after chapter. And it's just gross. It's gross. There's nothing sacred about this. There is nothing sacred about saying, reading a story. So the Philistines fought. Israel was defeated and they fled everyone to his home. I don't care who you are. This is not, this is not religious. This is not religious text. This isn't sacred. There's nothing helpful or healthy. This is, all this does is perpetuate more violence. Your sacred texts chapter after chapter, book after book, violence. How is the king, the second king of Israel chosen? Because he could defeat somebody. He was able to kill somebody. That's how he was chosen. Well, no. Okay. So he was chosen before that sort of secretly on the sly. But because David could, and that's also funny because, you know, the story of David and Goliath, it's not really, really David. There's somebody else who does this thing with Goliath. I, I talk about that in one of my, in one of the chapters in my book, Persian Granted. There's at least three different stories in the Hebrew Bible about the slaughter of this giant named Goliath. So, yeah, it's just convenient to attribute it to David, but that's not really, you know, and again, historically speaking, we don't know who David was anyway. Anyway. It's just ick. Chapter after chapter, it makes me anxious and angry and tired and exhausted. And just, I want to just throw my hands up. This is, it's 
No wonder <laughs> this part of the world has been constantly fought over. Does everybody who turns to the monotheistic God, the God of Abraham, which would be the three monotheistic, primary monotheistic traditions on the planet, these stories are a part of your sacred tradition. Fighting over this swath of land and the people who were there first are being demonized over and over and over again, either because they worship other gods or just because they were in the way. So I just you know, throw my hands up, right? Because this is ancient history, but these are texts that people read. And these people, whether you are a Jew or a Christian, and I do not know how it functions for Muslims, so I'm not even going to begin to go there, but I know how it functions for many, many Jews and Christians. And that is, it is taken as true and real. These texts have a material reality in our current day, because, because they're in our sacred texts. And so Jews and Christians alike have to be asked in a very particular way to reconsider that these are not actually historically true. And it wasn't, I know I've said this before, I'm going to keep repeating some of these things because I think it's important for people to get this. It wasn't until my mid-30s, okay? <laughs> it wasn't until my mid-30s. Yes, I was in my mid-30s before I had someone ask me by way of a reading, by way of a book, right, that had something important to say that I hadn't considered or I thought they might have something helpful for me. And so I'm going to go read this. And they all of a sudden invited me to look at this narrative, these promises, not just problematizing all the crap about, you know, treating women like property and it's just awful and good God, we could do that all day because I will continue to do this for a very long time to cover all the passages. But not just that, but that basic premise that God promised a certain piece of land to Abram and his descendants. And it's weird now after 15 years of not thinking of it that way, to think that I hadn't questioned that, but I hadn't. So here's the thing, folks. I guarantee you, I guarantee you that m I could almost use B, but I'll say M, millions, right? Billions of people on the planet currently have not, they have not interrogated this premise. It's in their scriptures. They might take other things, not literally. They've been doing that for years. It's not a big, I know the story, the gospels. Yeah, it's just, let's take it a little bit open-handedly. But this, the promise of a particular swath of land to Abram and his descendants, that they'll be large enough to be, you know, to be a blessing to others around them. And that, right? So those three things kind of all combined. This promise this land, God gave a promise to Abram and his descendants. So, of course, of course they belong there. I hadn't thought that through and all of its implications until 15, 16 years ago. So, and I've been trying to do this. And it shook up a lot for me. So can you imagine how many people on the planet have never taken a moment to reconsider that this is just a made-up narrative? Because for them, it's God's word. And even if, well, it's a little bit sketchy. I know this isn't real or historical. But this something about the fact that God promised land to Abram and that like that's where they belong. And we're not going to pay too close attention to all the battles and all the details because that's a little bit, that's a little bit tedious. <laughs> but, you know, God gave Abram a promise and that's real because look, they're all these descendants of his as if that makes it real, but it does somehow because people continue to pass along this collection of texts. They are still sacred texts for people, for Christians and Jews. And so 
people, whether you live in Israel or not, and you come from a Jewish family, you are quite likely to have that idea passed, told to you repeatedly to have it as a part of your thinking, like a mantra. I have a distant relative who, who's a Jewish man. He was trained as a rabbi, but he didn't go into that kind of a, into work. But he he does try to work on peace in the Middle East. And I really ridiculously and overly boldly probably asked him to what extent he considers the role that this narrative has played. And he let me know that he works on peace in the Middle East and that he supports a two-state solution, and he would not acknowledge the role that the biblical text has played for 2,000 years in people's thinking about this part of the world. And I respect that because it's, it's big. It's a lot. But, you know, the, the Facebook post I read last week said, unless you're helping these, these groups of people, and it's more than just two, by the way, it's not just Israel and Palestinians and like, or Hamas and Palestinians and now Hezbollah's involved. And like, it's not like, there are all kinds of subgroups of people within these people, right? It's not, you know, Palestinians are not all Muslim, for instance, <laughs> there are plenty of Christian Palestinians, there are plenty of um, Jewish Palestinians. There are not, you know, like, and within Christianity, there's more than one group of Christians within Palestine. Anyway, I got distracted again. What was I saying? Shoot, I got distracted about that. What was I saying? Um, crap, sorry. I had a train of thought and I lost it. And... Oh, that's hilarious. I really don't remember what I was saying. That's funny. Um, let's see. Um, I'm trying to talk about this passage, this war, this everything that's messy and going on. And can someone, more than one group of Christians, Palestinians, or maybe, thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Got those two. What else was I, what was before, before that, that helped, that I was trying to get at? You guys are great. I appreciate that, by the way. Um, shoot. So, um, this r distant relative who's trying to create peace in the world, in the Middle East, people don't want to actually talk about what this passage is actually doing, how it's informing people. Yeah, they are my distant relative, the rabbi. Thank you. You are actually paying attention. Um, I mean, I didn't mean it that way. I mean, because you all are chit-chatting and sometimes I just don't expect people to always be listening because, you know, we're all multitasking in this world. I'm so sorry. I completely forgot what I was trying to say about all that. Um Yeah, this distant relative is trying to do important work. He can't even, he can't, he, I don't know if he didn't want to acknowledge to me that the biblical passage plays a role or if he knows that it does and there's no way beyond it. Oh, that's what it was. Okay, thank you all for helping me. Yes, exactly. That was the Facebook post. So I acknowledged last week, and I appreciate this, that unless we're actually helping these groups of people get unstuck, I don't know that there's anything terribly helpful that I can do, right? I think it's really important to, you know, how do we save, how, I mean, at this point, how do we prevent a genocide? That's my thought, really. I'm terrified that this is going to be a near genocide of Palestinians. Like that is my fear or the people in Gaza. Ugh. That is my fear. And I couldn't say it on Thursday, but I was thinking it. And um, so I actually respect that. I really, I, I don't know how to help get them unstuck. And I think that's what needs to happen. But what, what frustrates me as a biblical scholar then is that, when they sit down to have the conversations about a two-state solution, for instance, what are they, what is, what are the assumptions in their head that are directing the, where they draw lines? What are the assumptions in their minds that they're not even aware of? The unconscious assumptions about who belongs where or to whom do certain pieces of land belong because God promised it. Um, you know, 
that's what that's what concerns me is the number of people in a given room for that conversation about a two state solution. There are going to be people what from the UN who are what either non religious, thank God. <laughs> That's funny to say, um, or at least distantly Christian influenced, perhaps Jewish or maybe some Muslim. But like most of the people on those councils, on those pan, like in those positions, come from a Western influenced position on things, which predominantly sides with Israel, right? Not and not just because of some sort of all the different political blah blah blah, but also the weird religious like stuff for some conservatives about you know the return of Jesus, but also just this generalized idea that's been out there their whole lives about God and the land and God's chosen people. And Christians, for the most part, will pull away from the Hebrew Bible narrative in when it comes to daily living. But there's still this understanding that that's what went down initially between Abram and God. And that does not go away until you actively deconstruct it for yourself. And I promise you, most of the people that are going to sit down in whatever room, in whatever place to have that conversation have not deconstructed the influence of this narrative that talks about fighting and that talks about God giving a land to his chosen. So that's what terrifies me in it all. I, th that people today trying to have those peace peace a full peaceful or towards peace conversations are not aware of their own internalized unconscious belief about the veracity of these passages instead of it being a narrative that a bunch of people created for their own benefit that's what terrifies me is peace and a peaceable solution is still not being led by people who are willing to interrogate what they have, what they just assume. Am I making sense? Are you all tracking with what I'm trying to say? That this is why I do what I do. This is one of the reasons I do what I do. The people do not even know the extent to which they have internalized unconsciously so many of the messages in this collection called the Bible. And this particular issue is one of the biggies. It's one of the last that people interrogate. Um, well, it was one of the last for me. And I imagine that that is the case for a lot of people. Um, and then, of course, right, I ask this man who is literally in conversations about two state solutions, if they talk about in those conversations, if they talk about the role the biblical narrative plays in this clusterfuck, and he didn't know how to or want to acknowledge that question. I respect that, tricky, all of that, but also that's a problem right? I don't care. I don't care what your ideology is or, or religious identity or national identity. If you can't, if you're having, if you're helping lead the conversations about peace and you cannot even acknowledge that this text, these texts play a role, we're not going to get anywhere. Because you're there is a side taking that happens if you have not interrogated for yourself the people around you, the people around the table, and yeah, the people that are then going to be affected by it, all millions of them. We're not going to get anywhere until we actually resolve the effect of the material effect of these fictional narratives, right? Gosh, I hope I'm making sense. Okay. And then, yes, you know, um, 
this is why I'm talking about it this way. I'm a biblical scholar, and 1948 is was deeply informed. The choices made in 1948 were deeply informed by the belief in this narrative, right? I mean, there's no way around that. But the narrative is fiction. <laughs> we made it real by believing it, not the other way around, right? Um, and I can't help but think about the, and this is the last thing I'm going to say because this is specific and it's, again, I keep thinking of my colleague's comment, unless you're helping get them unstuck, you're on mute to me. I actually really deeply appreciate that. But I do want to say this one thing, which is um, hang in there with me. I'm connecting this to other moves because, you know, the 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 slogan a a a land with no people for a people with no land doesn't hold water because there were people living there 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 were people already in the land and and people got to say that that there was a land with no people to begin with how the fuck did they get to say that right they got to say it and over and over and it's a slogan and like what the hell? There were people living there. At least 750,000 were told to evacuate. Does this sound familiar, right? This is this is terrifying to me because 750,000 people were told they needed to leave, but they all believed they would be going right back, you know? What is it? 1.1 million, maybe more than that, are being told to leave because we're going to annihilate everything, right? And so what's going to happen after that? Like there's going to be nothing to go back to, blah blah or you didn't get out didn't get out in time because we have no resources, everything's cut off, blah. I mean, it's just it screams genocide to me. So, and it's the same thing all over again. I'm going to pass out. I'm just so oof, angry and confused about. So this is why this is why I need to just not talk about it anymore, but I I do hope that my point about the role that these biblical texts have played over the centuries leading up to today, including today, including the Balfour Declaration of 1911, including the establishment of a state of Israel, you know, in including the choice that a former president made, right, to acknowledge Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, like all of those things are informed by this biblical narrative, taking this fictional narrative as real. <laughs> Thank you, festering boils. <laughs> first of all, that's the first time I've seen your name. I, you may have been here before, but I did. Yes. The real problem is ind indoctrination into these religions and the lack of clarity about what to do with these stories. So, okay, that's enough on that. We're going to move on. Okay, I feel like I need to do some jumping jacks or something, get up and move around a little bit. So there was only one story that I noticed. So we are actually going to go read. Um, <laughs> as much as I'm complaining about it, I think we need to go read it because it leads. So we're going to read the story about David being ch chosen and his slaughter of Goliath because it leads right into it's all the setup to in my mind um Jonathan Jonathan uh, David and Jonathan and Jonathan falling in love with him and so so there's one story that I found in chapter four excuse me of first Samuel and that is about um I think this is Eli. Eli has a daughter-in-law and um, yes, Eli's son Phineas has a woman, has a woman. Um, now Eli's daughter-in-law, the woman, my English says wife, the woman of Phineas was pregnant about to give birth when she heard the news that the Ark of God was captured. So this is part of this back and forth fighting that I just think is just awful. And I can't even that her father-in-law and her man were dead, my English says husband. She bowed and gave birth for her labor pains overwhelmed her. 
as she was about to die, the women attending her said to her, do not be afraid for you've born a son. <laughs> it's just, I mean, <sighs> oh, great. My purpose is fulfilled. I brought a man into the world. But she did not answer or give heed. She named the child Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed from Israel. Because the ark of God had been captured and because her father-in-law and her man, they were all dead. So she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. So I'm highlighting this story because it shows us again that a woman's, you know, the language is teaching us to think of marriage when their relationships didn't have the same language that we do. So I'm trying to highlight every single time when we see husband and wife that it really should be man and woman. And this one fascinating reference to her, she's not even named, right? But she does give birth to a son. And so everybody's happy for her. As she leaves her body physically and dies, everybody's happy because she succeeded. <laughs> okay so yeah there's that now the story of david being chosen is really i'm sure people have read it before you've read this right or you've heard it or i don't know but i'm going to read it it's a little bit it doesn't it falls outside of my typical lenses for this live stream but it's an interesting story and like i said it does lead into this one of the more fascinating passages of scripture, in my opinion, because it's um, the language used. So let me read. So yeah, this is going to go on for you know a little bit here, because I do want to do actual story time reading this story. And then we'll get to talk briefly about um, the language. And I think most of, the, <laughs> most of the people watching this already know this, but so we'll go over it again. Okay, so here we go. Um, Saul has been disobedient and so as king and he has repented and everybody knows that he's blown it. So they're going to replace him. So the Lord said to Samuel, the one who anointed Saul as king, Samuel was the son of Hannah, the woman who prayed and prayed and prayed, um, and was teased by her rival wife, the rival wife. Okay. So Hannah's son, Samuel has been doing all these things. So the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. I just love the fact that God is, it's, that's what they're saying. God is actually rejecting people. God keeps making bad choices, apparently. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. So this is 1 Samuel 16. Sorry, I forgot to mention where I'm starting. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? <laughs> There's a whole story there, right? That, that you would be terrified that the priest of the temple is not coming in peace in any way. He said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And boy, don't we know what a great heart David has. <laughs> Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. 
He said, are, are all your sons here? And he said, well, there remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and had him brought in. Now, he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Youngest of the sons, right? Think about this, the age what does it mean? What age do we describe people as ruddy? Do you know what I mean? Like, is that a thing you say about like teenagers, children? Do you say that about adults? I don't know if you do. I don't know. But anyway. Um, the Lord said, rise and anoint him for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. <laughs> and then an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. I This is a whole segment like tangent. I'm not going to take it, but I, we could, right? Um, I, I like to point this out to people who, who've been trained to think about scripture as all positive and every single word is what God intended. I'm like, really? Because God is sending an evil spirit to torment someone? Not sure I know what to do with that if you think this is actually how God behaves, right? And Saul's were, instead of thinking about, you know, what kind of uh, mental distress, mental um, disease, it, imbalance, right? Saul might have been dealing with instead, right? Uh, bipolar issues that are hard to, you know, regulate. And if you don't know, it's a thing to regulate because you think, God, you know, or seizures. I, I don't know, but their way of making sense of reality was far cry from the way it should be, right? Okay. And Saul's servants said to him, See now, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command the servants who attend you to look for someone who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the evil spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will feel better. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me someone who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite who was skillful in playing, a man of valor, a warrior, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Really? All of those? <laughs> a warrior, prudent? Is... Okay. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David, who is with the sheep. Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine and a kid and sent small goat and sent them by his son, David, to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer. Saul sent to Jesse saying, let David remain in my service for he's found favor in my sight. And whenever the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand and Saul would be relieved and feel better. And the evil spirit would depart from him. Is this great depression? You know, just anxiety. I don't know. Now, the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They, okay, right. So here we go again, right? I mean, <sighs> In light of what's happening right now, I can't even think about reading stories about battle, but I'm going to for the sake of what I'm doing here, right? Which is these are passages. It kills like it's just very difficult for me that they are literally the same peep names <laughs> as what's going on in reality. So I'm just dis I'm disconnecting from reality right now. OK, so that I can read these stories. And, hi, you know, and that. so I'm just highlighting for you that I do think it's a little bit problematic. That then as now, we want, people tend to want someone who's a good warrior to lead them as a people. 
I think that needs to be reconsidered. Okay. Now, the Philistines gathered their army for battle. They were gathered at Suko, Soko, which belongs to Judah, southern kingdoms, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damin. Saul and the Israelites gathered and encamped in the Valley of Elah. I don't know the geography here, and I just we're just rolling with this, and formed ranks against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. I don't even know how much a shekel is, but it doesn't really matter because that's really heavy. <laughs> And his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, today I def... Oh, this is awful. This is really hard to read. I, I'm not... I, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem and Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. So, you know, we just covered this last chapter. So coming from a different tradition, perhaps, that they're repeating it all again, this chapter. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three eldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were the first three that they marched forward, right? Eliab, the firstborn, the next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. 40 becomes more of a symbolic number than an actual number in the Hebrew Bible, right? 40 days and nights of rain, 40 years in the wilderness, 40 times he comes, you know, so more of a making a point than an actual number, right? Jesse said to his son, David, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp of your brothers. Also take these 10 cheeses to the commander of their thousands. See how your brothers fare and bring some token from them. Um, I don't know if any, any of you are youngest siblings and can relate to what's happening here. <laughs> Right, Jesse doesn't seem to understand who David is or how close he is located to Saul and that he's been chosen to be king. He didn't pick up on that in chapter 16. Um, yeah, so Jesse's taking care of his older sons. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure David just learned to live with it. Okay, now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the Valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, took the provisions, and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the encampment as the army was going forth to the battle line, shouting the war cry. 
Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, ran to the ranks, and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. All the Israelites, when they saw the man, fled from him and were very much afraid. The Israelites said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. The king will greatly enrich the man who kills him and will give him his daughter and make his family free in Israel. That's a whole fascinating little snippet to, to put in there, isn't it? Make his family free in Israel. Anyway, keep moving. David said to the man who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? People answered him in the same way. So it shall be done for the man who kills him. His eldest brother Eliab heard him talking to the men and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. He said, why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? You know, is it too petty that you can? Anyway, I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you've come down just to see the battle. David said, what have I done now? It was only a question. He turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your slave, it, it says servant, but I know in the Hebrew it's using the word slave, but your servant or slave will go and fight with this Philistine. He's calling himself that. Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you're just a boy. And he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. I love, the, I love the way people talk in third person. Okay. And whenever a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, swoosh it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, sorry, lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them since he has defiled, defied the armies of the living God. It's really hard for me to read the word Philistine. And I, you know, grew up thinking just such negative things about the Philistines because in the story, they are the enemy, but they're not, you know? They aren't actually, even at the time, they weren't the enemy. They were turned into the enemy because of the desires of those people. Okay. The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, well, go and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. And we earlier on, we are told that Saul was kind of above average height and was big, a very large man. So David said to Saul, I cannot w walk with these, for I'm not used to them. So he removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David. With his shield bearer in front of him. I'm just wondering if I should even be reading the story today. I don't know. Okay, I'm going to keep going. But I just... When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, 
come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air, to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. This is just too much for me to read today. <laughs> didn't think of it when I decided to just keep moving here into this book that we had started before everything happened. Um, so let me just finish this part of the story. When the, when the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David prevailed with a sling and a stone. There was no sword in his hand, so he ran and took the sword from the Philistine, drew it out of its sheath and killed him, and cut off his head with it. There's an interesting repeating kind of image of cutting off heads that happens in biblical stories. We have this one, then we have Judith with Holofernes in the apocryphal writings. We have one in one of the Gospels, the cutting off of john the baptist very different settings for sure um when the philistines saw that their champion was dead they fled the troops of israel and judah rose up with a shout and pursued the philistines as far as gath and the gates of ekron so that the wounded philistines fell on the way from Sha'arim as far as gath and ekron the israelites came back from chasing the philistines and they plundered their camp David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, as you do. <clears throat> but he put his armor in his tent. When Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of his army, Abner, whose son is this young man? I mean, you know, one chapter ago, David was working for Saul, apparently. You know, these are very clearly from different traditions. Abner said, as your soul lives, I, I don't know. King said, inquire whose son the stripling is. On David's return from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand, you know, again, as you do. Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? He answered, I'm the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. When David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Teenage love? What is that? Um, the soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. He saw how happy David made Jonathan, right? And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that he was wearing and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. It's an interesting image um, that I think people tend, many people, I don't think many people who are watching this uh, are likely to miss it, but he stripped himself of the robe he was wearing, his armor, his sword, and his bow. What is left? <laughs> his skibbies. <laughs> It's a, it's a pretty it's a pretty tender moment, huh? Pretty vulnerable moment. 
um, David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. As a result, Saul set him over the army and all the people, even the servants of Saul approved. And when we come to the end of their story after Jonathan trying to protect David, blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, <clears throat> Um, you know, it's pretty, it's, it's a difficult story to read, um, interesting and lots of trying to sneak around and Jonathan realizing that David, uh, makes his father angry for whatever reason. And so he's trying to protect him. Jonathan's trying to protect David and, Trying to find the place where they die. Um, is it 22? Why am I, why can I not? I thought it was 20, chapter 20. They have this whole thing. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. They have the, the la their last meeting right before, right before David runs away to hide. Jonathan, um, as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from where he'd been hiding he bowed three times to his friend, his intimate friend. He bowed three times. It's just kind of interesting. Uh, whatever that is um, in terms of respect or whatever. Um, and they kissed each other and wept with each other. David wept the more. And Jonathan said to David, go in peace, since both of us have sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord shall be between me and you and between my descendants and your descendants forever. He got up and left. Um, and then when they die, I have forgotten where that is. Um Sorry, my apologies. I, I was just always thinking it was right there. Um, when, when David mourns the death of Jonathan and Saul, and he talks about how Jonathan's love was greater than that of women. Um, I'm so sorry. I've, I'm a little embarrassed here because I don't know where that is. And I've, I've just lost track of where that is. Um, but I do talk about it in chapter 10 of my book um, because the, what, what so many people do not know, many, I mean, some people know, right, of course, but not everyone knows that um, what, what, you know, what we call soulmates today would have looked very different. Uh, what is it I'm trying, how am I trying to say this? The things that we attribute to soulmates today would predominantly have only happened between people of the same sex. Um, so on that level, it's not a surprise to see that Jonathan and David, Jonathan's soul was bound to David's. Um, but, every, you know, all of the things that people today tend to talk about being a part of an, a part of a marriage for them today, um, those, those, you know, soulmate, intimate friendships, um, you know, make a list. Those, those would have been fulfilled by people of the same sex in the ancient world. Um, so there's kind of two different pieces going on here from my perspective when you're coming back to the theme of my live stream, which is that, you know, biblically speaking, we only see what qualifies as marriage today. We only see those components between people of the same sex in the Bible. I think that's worth just coming to terms with. Um and the only people who have soulmate language being used to talk about their relationship are David and Jonathan. And I know that a lot of people want to make this um, 
just good friends and um, you know, I'm not going to stop someone from doing what they need to do. But what I think is important is to honor what's being said and what's actually happening there. And you don't have soulmate language in reference to marriages in the Bible. You just don't. That doesn't happen anywhere. The one time it comes close is in the Song of Songs when a young woman is talking about her lover. They are not married. She's talking about um, the one whom my soul loves. She refers to her lover twice that way. That's it. It's a female claiming it about her lover. It's lovely and beautiful. Um, that's not within a married situation. I'm okay with that, right? But I think it's worth noting it was said it's said three or four times that Jonathan's soul is bound to the soul of David. I also think that it's fair to say that David takes advantage of that, sees what's happening and whether or not he feels the same, though it seems like he does by the time Jonathan dies. Um, I think he does take advantage of that or manipulate that some, you know, so adding to the, you know, David goes down in history as a man after God's heart. That's debatable. Um, uh, he's a manipulative son of a bitch, <laughs> among other things. But when you look at the language of the story, I think it's helpful for people who want to say they're just good friends. Then you can respond to that by saying, you know, this, this is the most intimate any relationship is described as being in the entire Bible is this love Jonathan has for David, whether or not it is reciprocated. Everybody knows. Everybody knows what's going on. Jonathan's father can see that David makes him really happy, right? Everybody knows. <sighs> and it just is what it is. And his love for me was like that, was greater than that of, of the love of women. Um, that is what David says when Jonathan dies. And David, not at that point in his life, but eventually does know the love of women on a certain level, right? So I think it's a fascinating thing. Um, David's just one, defeated this great giant um, who threatens them. And Jonathan just loves him as his own soul. I think it's really beautiful. He is a wife thief. I know, Karen. He is. I just, yep, yep. John Boswell has done some important stuff. He also has done some, you know, <laughs> there's a, you know, there, um, there was a, I need to go look that up. I have it. I have the reference. Um, I just saw the document in my, in my laptop the other day, um, that there was a king who wanted to marry his, his male lover and, uh, a priest accommodated that, you know, no problem. That happened mm, 1300s, 1200s, something like that. Um, yeah. So I think what, what's interesting then, let me just wrap this up for today. Uh, the story of David and Jonathan or what snippets we have of it, that friendship in the ancient world, including in the first century when we have the writings of the Newer Testament. Friendship then is what marriages look like today for the most part. The intimacy of the friendships, they were, and they were predominantly same sex. So soulmates, friends, people you do stuff with all the time, you know, sharing your life, sharing your dreams, sharing your heart and all, all those things. That was between friends in the ancient world. So when you want to talk about biblical marriage, I think that's a piece of the conversation to have that what marriages today look like, whenever we see that in scripture, it's only between people of the same sex. Just something to think about. I appreciate that you all are here. I appreciate that you put up with my ramblings or venting or whatever for the first half hour. It was important for me to try to say some of that. Um, I, I'm not sure how clear I was about it last week. Um, I'm not going to venture into these waters anymore because I'm not 
political science, right? I, I've said what I need to say as a biblical scholar, and that's about all I can say. Um, and I'm terrified of a genocide of the Palestinians taking place. That terrifies me. Um, I don't know what else to say about that. Thank you for being here for story time. Um, I should say that I'm taking a break next week. I'm getting some time off. So I will be here Thursday and then we'll, I'll be taking a break. Um, so we will, I'm not sure where else there is in first Samuel to be reading for the purposes of story time. And I appreciate you putting up with the story about a battle between ancient Philistines and ancient people that identify with Israel in the midst of this awful time for that same place in the world today. Thank you for putting up with all that. Um, I didn't intend reading that story to have any connection to today. I was reading the story for as the, the story time part of reading David's story and the lead in to David and Jonathan. I didn't intend to be endorsing something today with what I was doing. I hope that makes sense. Yes, exactly, Matthew. Right. Gilgamesh and Enkidu. I think many people have made that comparison and um, it's, I think it's an appropriate one to make. Yep. Um, I'm sure there are articles out there that have done that, um, you know, in terms of other scholars noticing the similarity, but absolutely you're right. Um, yeah. Thanks for being here. And <laughs> okay. I'm glad I'm, I appreciate some of your comments, just reassuring me that this was <laughs> worth watching or being here. So thank you. Um, I will be back again Thursday. Thanks for showing up or for watching this later. I appreciate it. Take care.